I'm C.W. Emerson, and this is The Older American Poet. On Lana Heckman Ayer's new poetry collection, The Autobiography of Rain, Michael McGee writes, These poems are full of the ache of loneliness, but are never loveless. They seem to make a long lyric narrative loop, a night train of the soul. And of Lana herself, from Leisha Adila Garcia, she leaps metaphorically to that numinous space where the everyday is mystical and profound. Her gift to the reader is an insightful gathering of revelations as if Neruda is sitting in her lap. Join me for part two of my conversation with poet and publisher Lana Heckman Ayers as we discuss the autobiography of Rain, the importance of poetry teachers and mentors, how to assemble a poetry manuscript, and covert poetry, surprising strategies for sharing poems in the most unusual places. So this is wonderful to be with Lana Heckman Ayers for part two of our conversation. Welcome. Thank you for taking the time with me today. Thank you so much, Chris. Oh, you're it's welcome. It's to be with you. It's my pleasure. And you have a wonderful new volume of poetry called The Autobiography of Rain that came out, I believe, August 6th. Yes, that's right. And has received rave reviews. People are loving it. Um, one of the things that brought us together is the presence of a wonderful poet and teacher in our lives, Cecilia Wallach. And uh, I thought we could say a little bit about our experience with Cecilia and um, move into our conversation in that way. How does that sound to you? That sounds wonderful. Great, great. Um, the first poem that uh, we were talking about having you read is a list poem. Mm -hmm. um, Cecilia's list poems have been inspirational to me. And you bookend your your uh, book, The Autobiography with, of Rain, with list poems. So the one that we were going to start with is uh, the last poem in the book, actually. Yes, that's right. Um, I, I think I, I want to say a few words about Cecilia and yes. then I'll read my poem. So right. uh, Cecilia introduced us in a way, which is wonderful. But I met Cecilia many years ago when she was my mentor in the MFA program I attended. The one that Patricia Fargnoli gave me that glowing recommendation for and I was admitted to. Now, Cecilia was, uh, wasn't my first mentor. She was my replacement mentor because the first mentor I was assigned, who shall remain nameless, <laughs> told me I couldn't write grandmother poems. I was absolutely forbidden to write what he called grandmother poems because grandmother poems are trite. Well, I wasn't having any of that. Not only is it sexist and ageist, but it's ridiculous because our ancestors are part and parcel of us. So uh, being a little bit ballsy because I had, you know, I had the voice of Patricia Frognoli in my head and, you know, and she was a strong woman who said to uh, advocate for yourself. I said, I'm going to leave this program unless you give me a different mentor. I'm not going to work with this mentor. And I had the great good fortune to be assigned Cecilia Wallach, who was amazing. All five feet of her, so, you know, maybe 80 pounds soaking wet, could take down any pontificating bruiser of the poetry patriarchy mm -hmm. with a few brilliant lines from her sultry lips. Yeah. And Cecilia said, anything goes in poetry as long as you sing it from your deepest, truest self. Yeah. Now, she was tough, but she was tender. Yeah. She pointed out all the places my language was lazy. And she offered hope and praise. And her belief in me that I could do better, I think, made me do better because I believed in her belief in me. And, and that's why I improved as a poet. And, and the other thing I want to say about Cecilia is that anyone who doesn't know her work, 
who doesn't know Cecilia Wallach's poetry needs to acquaint themselves with it immediately. And I think you'll agree with me on this, Chris. I think Cecilia Wallach is one of the finest living poets that we have. Her poems encompass history and the now, image and heart, and of course, song. Yes, yeah. I agree completely. Uh, when I was um, a baby poet, uh, I found a volume of her work and I read it. And I said out loud, apropos of nothing, this woman is going to be my teacher. I didn't know she was a teacher. I knew she was a remarkable poet uh, that I felt an immediate kinship with. And it turns out she's an amazing, uh, really world-renowned teacher. And she became my mentor and teacher. Mm -hmm. um, in, in trying to write what became the title poem of a collection of mine, it took 27 drafts, one draft a week, until I found the voice and found the heart of the poem and it started to sing. So I agree with you completely yeah. about Cecilia. Yeah, and she's so generous. She's so incredibly generous. Very, very. But yeah, anyone who hears this interview, you have to read Cecilia Wallace. Yes, and you speak about grandmothers. Um, her family is all through her poetry. Oh, yes. My very favorite Cecilia Wollock poem is called Teta. Oh, yes. A poem about her great aunt. Yes, uh, yes. And I thought and still think if I can ever write a poem that good, I'll be a worthy student of Cecilia's. Yeah. So let's, with that, why don't you share uh, the, the poem that you're going to start with, which ends the book? It ends the book. And um, I already, I think, I think that we mentioned this in the other time we spoke, but um, I'd already had the title for the book, but the title didn't appear in a poem. So I kind of had to write this <laughs> for the book. And um, it has an epigraph. The epigraph is, listen to me as one listens to the rain. Octavio Paz. Things you will er only learn about me when it's too late. I wanted to grow up to be an astronaut so I could escape the gravity of childhood. My first crush was on the winter night sky. In a crowd of people, mosquitoes bite me first. Sleep was never a friend. Barbie, a sworn enemy, with her wasp waist and long straight blonde locks. My dark hair never grows much below my ears. Hula hoops, hula hoops and I reached a discordant truce. I failed at everything, some things more than once, some things hundreds of times. This hasn't stopped me trying. The forest canopy is my adopted family. Coffee is a verb. Poetry is breakfast. My heartbeat aligns with Atlantic Ocean's pulse. Klutz, I have spent my entire life falling. First in love with shadow, then with chiascuro. Once, I pitched down a hill in a city park and would have kept rolling forever, except my head collided with a cedar tree and stopped me. Thankfully, the tree was unharmed. I trip over words, especially goodbye. I fell into mathematics as a major in college and am still solving for X. I stumbled into the oblivion of Earl Grey ice cream and never stumbled back out. I teeter on the seesaw of self-love with a fulcrum of constant panic that balances things out nicely. My life story is the autobiography of Rain. Lovely. And that's the that's the circle, closing the circle of the autobiography of Rain and tells us 
where it came from. It's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. As you um, noticed, I, I do have a thing for list poems. <laughs> I really enjoy writing them, but I also really enjoy reading them. So I, I'm hoping that we can hear a list poem of yours that you spoke about earlier, and we can talk a little bit about list poems. Well, I have a short one that was inspired by Cecilia, um, and it's called What Was Promised after Cecilia Wollock. A scattering of roses, a cut glass bowl, the racing form, some worthless tickets, luck of my own making, no homestead, the land sold off, the house demolished, a wooden gavel passed down to the son of a son of an auctioneer, a clarion voice like my father's voice and my grandfather's voice. A ring, yellow diamond, given, then taken back. Music, my first companion. The brilliance of autumn, ochre and orange-leaved days. Mud-caked boots in winter. And lakes, always a lake. Snow. Wow. I just adore that poem. All the items in your list. Uh, you, you talk about what was given, what wasn't given, what was taken away, and what you had to give yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's just, it, it's just so exceptional. And that last item in the list, the real, it's real and ephemeral like all of us, snow. You just feel that. You feel that moment of, the beauty of snow interacting with a single flake and how quickly it's all gone. It's, it's so powerful and passionate and all of the images are so vibrant and real, you know, from the, the roses to the cut glass, to the, to the voice of the ancestors, the father, the grandfather, it's just really powerful. Thanks. And it speaks to the importance of a teacher, Cecilia, helped put that last line that's really a stanza it's a whole stanza help me put that last stanza there wouldn't have known to do that yeah and that's the generosity as well of a teacher we could talk about that for days we could we yeah. could yeah um, i want to ask you about the way in which um you put together this this book and and all of your other books because you're mm -hmm. quite prolific this is not your first time at the rodeo it's not your first collection um, and I wonder if this is a, a good time for you to maybe say a little bit that will help other people about um, how you assemble a manuscript, what goes through your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this particular book is kind of different. It, it was organized a little bit differently than I've organized other books. And, I'll, and here's, the, I mean, one of the secrets that I've told you is that, um, you know, I didn't have the last poem for the book and I didn't I, it didn't originally um have that first list poem either so what I would normally do is arrange a book front to back but there was something different about what <clears throat> excuse me just a second there was something different I felt about this book um it's arranged in three sections and roughly the sections are laid out. And what I would call the first section is sort of foundational griefs <laughs> where I come from. The second section is sort of everyday griefs, including pandemic and other things that occurred in life. And the last section, grief and joy as partners in, in an enriching life. Um, and that, that makes its way through from back to front, uh, from front to back, you know, as here's where I came from, here's what I experienced, here's where um, where I've developed to and hope to continue going. But also, you can read this collection back to front, and it would be an origin story. Um, it would be more of a story of joy that evolved and is ongoing traveling back through time into life's pitfalls and how even though traveling through 
time, you could see all along the journey that there were these kernels coming about for future joy and acceptance and love, you know, and peace. And that's kind of kind of interesting for me because I've never thought about doing that. But I think I might have mentioned I'm I'm sort of a time travel enthusiast, anyways. Um, and I wrote a time travel novel. So yeah, I kind of wanted this book to be able to be read either front to back or back to front. So that's kind of a little secret about how this book is different from all other books I've organized. And that other secret that I didn't have the final poem, originally the penultimate poem was what I had when I first put the manuscript together, it's short poem. Um, and uh, the first poem was the second poem in the collection, which is a poem, probably the oldest poem in the book. I wrote it many years ago. Um, for a Seattle city council meeting where they invited me to read a poem. And uh, it was a poem about art and writing. Uh, but those were the original first and last poems in the book. But I realized, well, I already had the title, The Autobiography of Rain, but the poems the elite and the opening poem specifically wasn't really telling the reader about the journey they were about to take. It wasn't saying you're on this journey with someone for their autobiography. So I had to go back and say, okay, what will tell the reader that? And um, so I actually had by that time figured out that I needed to write a poem with the title in it. And I'd written that poem and I knew that was going to be the last poem. So I had to go back and write a first poem for the book. Um and uh, this might be, I have to, I have to consult my notes on this, but there's, um, uh, so it, most people know who Susan Sontag is. And she wrote the introduction to poet Adam Zagajewski's book, Another Beauty, another mm -hmm. incredible book of poems. If you've never read it, you need to read that one. And her comment was, autobiography is the occasion to purge oneself of vanity while advancing the project of self-understanding, call it the wisdom product, project, which is never completed, however long the life. And I, you know, I, I thought about that when I was putting together um, the first poem for the book. And I also thought about um, what, Poet Matthew Dickman says, I've taken a bunch of classes with him, and he says, all art is an articulation of where we are, who we are, and what we are making at that moment. So I sort of tried to embody all of this and have a poem that would say, reader, here's what you're in for. <laughs> um. And that's what I try to do when I'm organizing poetry collections for others and for myself. Mm -hmm. I want to create a journey for the reader that feels fruitful. A first poem that sets the reader on the path of what is ahead for them. And then each poem in the book should be connected to one another by emotion or theme or image specific language, maybe time progression, movements through time, not necessarily linear. Mm -hmm. But I I like a book where the reader feels where they've traveled along with the poet, not just on the poet's journey, but they're taking their own journey alongside. Now, as a reader myself, I find some poetry collections um, jump around in subject matter and emotion wildly, and they take leaps that are too big for me to take so that I can only read the book, you know, one or two poems at a time, and then I have to set it aside before I'm ready to take that leap. And that's one way of organizing a book. Yeah. But honestly, I have a personal preference to read a poetry book all the way through. I just want to be completely enthralled the way one is when you're reading memoirs or novels. And um, I want to feel compelled 
mm -hmm. all the way through to keep on going on this journey with the poet. And at the end, I want to feel breathless and sated the way one might feel if they've just raced the last few steps on the journey home. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's like the perfect collection for me. And that's how mm -hmm. I try to organize other people's collections, because I do do that. People do hire me to help them with organization. Um, and that's kind of what I hope you'll find, whether you read Autobiography of Rain Back to Front or Front to Back. I'm did I tell Lana, did I tell you that <laughs> it's a secret of mine that I guess I, I don't know if I'm going to spill it. Who cares? But I read poetry books very often back to front. Mm -hmm. I do too. I don't know why I do it, but I do too. Do you? Oh, I do. I'll read it front to back, and then I'll go read it go back, back to front. Yeah. Yes. Would you, would you share with us the first poem in the book? Absolutely, absolutely. It's called "19 Things No One Knows About Me, and One They Do." And you just want to say, you might notice some of the same images from the final poem make it into this poem as well. I once had a brother who was a distant planet. Clear winter nights, I can almost spot his nebula. I was born dark. Things progressed from there. My favorite color is swirl. Think Van Gogh's starry night. My favorite bird is a crow, but only when there is snow on the ground. Otherwise, my favorite bird is an astronaut. Hills cloaked in fog is my best outfit. My real mother is the moon, a cold stone barren of its own glow. My real father was good humor, which explains my obsession with ice cream. I have been mistaken for the help, but I've never worked that hard. Salt is my favorite vegetable. If I could be anything I want when I grow up, I would be a pizza. Everyone loves pizza. Once I tripped and had to crawl back home. My knees bled in the pattern of rose petals. Twice, I made the same hasty mistake. It cost me my sanity and a few subway tokens. Three times was not a charm for me. There are days I can't face, sometimes weeks, years. The mirror me glares. My name used to be synonymous with sorrow, so I changed it to be synonymous with wool. Whenever I see the sea, my eyes water. Whenever I smell cream spinach, my mouth waters. A man once told me I was beautiful. He also said, God is a blowfish. The rain is my best friend. She knows how to keep a secret and wash away the evidence. The answer to every question I ever asked is poetry. Mm. Lovely. It, it strikes me that not only in that poem, but in many of your poems, the body plays a central role. Um, can you talk about the place of, of the body in your poetry? There's a quote uh, in, in one of your poems about inheriting your grandmother's mm -hmm. dulcet hands, clumsy mm -hmm. thumbs, gnarled knuckles, and my own briny pulse. Mm -hmm. How does the notion of embodiment find its way into your work? Well, I think, you know, I always felt trapped in my body in a way, like that my body didn't represent what was going on inside me. And I feel that way about so many people you know, you never know what lives inside a person. Um, you know, I, ha I have a poet friend who, you know, on the outside doesn't conform to what society would call a beautiful human being. You know, he's, he's larger, he's 
um, a little bit, uh, I don't know, grumbly, you know, kind of person. On the inside, he has this incredible, glorious soul and writes the most sensuous, beautiful poetry you could ever imagine. And you would look at him, you know, at a bus stop and think, I don't want to stand too close to that guy, you know. Um, but, and I felt the same way, trapped in my body. I was a heavy child, very, very heavy child. You know, we uh, didn't have a lot of money and we accepted whatever we were given a lot of the time, which was, you know, cheese the size of car batteries and slimy green beans and cans and ketchup as our vegetables, actually. And, um, you know, we didn't have a healthy diet. So I was a really chubby kid and I felt trapped in this body with hand-me-down clothes that didn't fit. Um, and I, I, I was kind of at war with my body. And it took me years to realize that um, the body is a beautiful container if you make peace with it and you understand it and you learn how to be within a body that is temporary and fragile but yet allows you to enjoy this incredible world that we live in, that is full of senses that brings you into this incredible world. Um, and that took years for me to learn. You know, it took years for me to understand that, uh, that the way that I was being judged for all of the ways I didn't fit in with society's feeling of what a person should look like. I had skin that was very dark, I had hair that was very wild, you know, an afro that always was needing taming and um, and bursting out of clothes that never fit right. Um, yeah, it took a long time to say, I'm okay with this. And not only am I okay with this, but I'm. this is a gift. This is a gift. So. Yeah. Um, I have a, a poem that's called Body that I'd like to share with you. Uh, it carries with it a lot of the ideas that you've just put forward. Um, and here it is, body. The body is a map of what befalls it, both a map and the territory it signifies. Its borders are drawn in bruised and sutured flesh. My body is a map of lake and woodlands, white with winter, umber and autumn, multiple the dreams by which it is riven. This is the dream it is dreaming now. Someone is singing a lamentation while the body melts in the sun's fierce rays. Wow. It's, it's an exquisite poem that speaks to fragility and rawness and the, the temporary nature of our lives and the power we can claim with our bodies mm -hmm. if we're willing to. And that last image, um, you know, it, it harkens back to your, to your poem, what was promised that last image harkens back to the snow that we're all so ephemeral, but look at how beautiful and glorious we are in the moment that mm -hmm. we shine. I mean, it's, it's exquisite, absolutely exquisite. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I think I may have said this before in our previous conversation. Um, it reminds me that all poems are written out of love. Mm -hmm. I, I like to say that every poem we write is a love letter to the reader who we may never meet and may never know, but who needs our words as much as we needed to write them. Um, but I'm going to consult my notes here again. But, but poet Liesl Mueller says it even better. She says, still love is the impulse from which poetry springs, even dark poems, especially dark poems. To know the worst and write in spite of that, that must be love. Mm. To celebrate what's on the other side of darkness. Mm. And your poem of the body, that just illustrates everything Liesl Mueller has just said. And, and you can feel that poem is written out of love for these beings that we are. Yes, I, and I agree with you that all poems 
are written out of love in one way or another. But it makes me question, why is it so difficult, at least for me, and I don't know if this is true for you, why is it so difficult or challenging to write love poems? That's a really good question. And I think it's a question that some, some scholars have debated, but I, I think what makes it especially difficult is because love is, is one of those things that defies definition. You know, it's one of those things that, well, you know it when you feel it, right. <laughs> but you, how do you define it? And every love is different. I mean, the love that I felt for my grandmother is different than the love that I feel for my friend. You know, it's different than the love that I feel for my husband. It's different than the love that I feel for all of the poets who are giving of themselves and all of the art, you know, but love, but it's all love. It's all love and it's all different. And it, it's, how do you define each of these differently? I mean, how do you say specifically what makes this love connection between you and another being? How do you put that into words? It, it, it's, it's impossible, isn't it, to say, um, except to, I, I think, except to say, for me, the the extraordinary that is ordinary i think for me is the only way to approach it you know to put your finger on these ordinary things like um you know one day i was looking at this photograph i had keep a photograph of my grandmother on my desk and i she's with me all the time i don't know if you can see her yes. but i look a lot like her <laughs> <laughs> i look a lot like her the you know the hair everything um but one day i was studying this photograph and discovered oh my god those are my hands. Uh, Those are my hands. And I've always hated my hands because they've got, I've got these big knuckles and they're not very feminine. And then I looked at her hands and I said, oh my gosh, I just fell in love with my hands because I have my grandmother's hands. I'm almost going to cry. I mean, it just like that realization, like just that we are, that we are connected in body and soul. And she's long, long gone from this earth. And how do I put that in a poem? Right. Except to talk about her, her gnarled knuckles like I have. You have them. I have them. Part of your embodiment. I have my grandfather's heart. Oh. And that's been really full of challenges. Yeah, I bet. As well. Yeah. So. Yes. Yes. Now, in the autobiography of Rain, there's a relatively short section that, that has an arc to it. And it's an arc of uh, what I consider to be, what I read as love poems. One in particular that I was taken by is a love poem with soup. Yes. And I wonder if you could read that one for us. I, I would, yes. That, that poem is for Andy, who's my husband. Love poem with soup. The blender pulverizes fresh picked spinach as if its leaves were not fragile, generating a green slurry, a blood thick broth. And my husband measures in curried red lentils, sticky black quinoa, olive oil cured garlic and iodine rich salt to create a soup that will nourish me for the duration, withstanding weeks of freezing without suffering ice burn, withstand reheating in the nuclear gasp of the microwave, yet taste of a life bred in fertile soil under spring's violet rains and through summer's brickyard sun, our days in this garden so brief. That's beautiful. Love like soup needs to be <laughs> or can be experienced in a variety of environments yeah. and preparation modes, yeah. uh, seasons and yeah. seasonings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. I, it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's this act of creating the soup for me, you know, to sustain me that just, I, I just find so completely loving and generous, you know, that so that he does this and, and he does, he refreeze, <laughs> refreeze about 18 <laughs> servings of soup. And it it's just, it's just marvelous because it takes time and love and intentionality. Yes. Intentionality. Yeah. And that's just, it's just wonderful. Yeah. And you have an amazing poem in your luminous body glittering ash manuscript that i find breathtaking and i wonder if you could read that sure um it's a it's a poem that has again cecilia wallach her fingerprints are all over it because i think the original poem was about a page and a half and uh she suggested that I whittle it down to about 10 lines <laughs> and 10, hopefully the 10 best lines. But in any case, uh, it's a poem that relates to my uh, first marriage now defunct um, as, ca as captured in uh, a group of poems in the new book called D divorce epistles, but we won't go there. This is uh, those are love poems too, mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Uh, it, it occurs to me now listening to you talk about that. But this is called To G, Late November, Six Weeks Married. You've asked me to tell you what I want for the world, for myself, and for us. I want to be the wound and the linen that binds it, the medicine that heals it, the earth and the sky. So come to bed. It's late. And we're married now. It's it's so gorgeous. And it says everything. I want to be the wound and the linen that binds it. That duality we talked about last time. Yes, it all of life, the double nature of our lives. Life yeah. itself is duality and love. Well, how can love not be that if love is life? It's It's a breathtaking poem. Thank you. And it, it reminds me of um, another thing that I want to quote um, about, about duality and lovers are parted in death or they leave us and everything is partnered in this life, which, you know, Ursula Le Guin um, was a poet and a, and a novelist, but in her novel, the earth sea novels, I don't know if you've read them, they're magical. She has this, this list of duality. Only in silence, the word. Only in dark, the light. Only in dying, life. Bright, the hawk's flight on the empty sky. Mm. And the way that you talked about love in there and being the sky, it reminded me of Ursula Le Guin. Mm. And yeah, the duality and and the difficulty of love, because these lives are so brief and these bodies are so fragile and our nature is duality. Oh, you yes. bring it all together in that one brief poem. Thank you. And and I want to say as well, throughout this book, I could cite example after example where there is the ethereal um, side by side with the everyday, with the mundane there's almost the mystical quality of rain uh, and weather that echoes through this book uh, side by side with soup making and uh, a variety <laughs> a variety of other everyday uh, activities self reflections um, it's it's a beautifully artful way of experiencing the world and helping your reader experience it along with you it's a beautiful book. I wanted to talk to you uh, for just a second about this idea we touched on last time. You talked about uh, when you were a, a student, I believe, uh, poems were, it was suggested to you by the teacher to leave your poems in a public place. Yeah. And that idea kind of caught fire with me. Um, 
what could we, what could we, what might we do with poetry, with our poems, to move it into the public sphere in a sort of an unexpected way? Um, yes. Did that strike you as well? That that idea. Yes, and 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 that was my mentor, Otone Riccio. Um, and yes, he wanted us to all go and bring our poems to the Sears appliance department and handful of magnets and tack them up on the refrigerators. And yes, I, I thought that was just a wonderful idea. Um, and there's wonderful things that you can do. Uh, some of the things I thought about, and this one I really always have wanted to try. Uh, we have on the, uh, Coast here in, in Washington State and in Oregon, loads of coffee shops. We are the coffee shop capital, I think, of the U.S., perhaps. I don't know. Maybe because it rains so much, people need coffee. But I have always wanted to slip poems in those stacks of napkins in between the stacks so that when people reach for them, they get a handful of napkin and a poem. Oh. I just have always wanted to do that. I haven't yet had the courage, but I will someday. Oh, I'm going to challenge you to that. <laughs> <laughs> and if you'll do it, I'll go down to the coffee shop down the street from from our house here in Mexico, uh, where a lot of the gringos go, but not only. And they have stacks of books that you can take one, replace one, take one, replace one. And I'll find a poem of mine or a couple poems that aren't too dark and dreary. And I'll place those in the books if you'll put some in the napkin stand. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> I love it. And the, the other things that I think uh, would be great is um, you can, you know, if you're ever traveling, you can leave poems all over the airport. I mean, there's a lot of places you can leave poems in an airport. Um, you know, just leave a couple on a table. Uh, if you're in a bus station, you can slip them into the schedules, you know, where they have the schedules, slip them into the slots where the schedules are. I think that would be great. Um, and I, I would love to leave poetry all over public parks, but not to litter, you know, that the paper has to be biodegradable and the ink, you know, non-poisonous so we don't harm any of the creatures that might eat it. But yes, they're, you know, just under a rock here and there, you know, what a and great idea. Washes, if it washes away and soaks into the earth, well, the earth has your poems. Wow. But, you know. Biodegrad biodegradable poems. Biodegradable poems. I love and, that and, idea. And I'm a big fan of thrift, I, you know, because the way I grew up, I'm a big fan of thrift shops. So um, slipping poems into the, the, the uh, vintage shoes, slipping poems into the vases, and especially, like you said, in the, in the books. Yeah. Um, I think that would be wonderful. And restaurants too. Some some of them have those menus that have those uh, cellophane sort of covers mm -hmm. on them. You could slip them under the cellophane. Yeah, I think there's so many wonderful places. I love that. Uh, we should be doing more of that, I think, in I think life. So. Just the randomness. Um, and they don't all necessarily, do they have to be uh, all sweet poems that are wrapped up with a nice bow or can we be challenging? I, I think they can just be poems that are real. Just poems that are real that people recognize that, yeah, yeah this is real life. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah. speaking of real life, I wonder if we can wind our conversation down with a list poem of Cecilia's, since that's mm -hmm. been a running theme of our talk today. Yes. Um, it's the one that inspired my list poem, um, and I believe it's called What Was Promised to Me. Yes. Would you yes. read that? Uh, I would love to read that. Take us out. And it's from her award-winning chapbook called Earth. Yes. It came out a number of years ago from Two Sylvia's Press. And it's actually the first poem in her book. What Was Promised Me? Nothing. A ring and some salt. Rice in the white shoes. Music. A doll. The book my mother read to me over and over when I was a child. Tigers turning to butter to milk. 
An amulet from a boy who carried a knife in his pocket, too. Night. I was not promised dawn. Stars hooked to sky by my father's hands. Love like a tree I could climb to the top of and then jump down from or swing from or fly. Mercies so small I could hide each one inside a flower. Sharp white teeth, a clock made of pearls, each pearl an hour and the hours numberless. The pink dress that disappeared, where did it go? And the tiny ballerina spinning and spinning inside a dome. A door that would open and close. No house, no home, but the story I've lived toward. Luck running out like a shimmer of wind. Two buckets full of cold water, wood for a fire, and flame. Thank you. Thank I you. I just love that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, your, it's... Book, <laughs> your, your book is uh, now available. Yes. And so I'm going to make sure that we have a, a link to uh, the autobiography of Rain so that people can purchase it after they have listened to us extol it and it's a wonderful wonderful book uh back to front front to back i've very much enjoyed reading it more than once now thank you and i want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today uh, poet publisher lana heckman Ayers, the autobiography of rain is the book thank you so much thank you so much chris and thank you for reading your poems and as your poem says, all we're promised is the moment we're given, pretty much. And I hope that's what people take away from the autobiography of Rain, to make the best of every moment. And I wish you and all our listeners peace, and may you find poetry wherever you look. Thank you so much, Chris, Thank for you. this conversation. Thank you, Lana. I'm C.W. Emerson, and this is The Older American Poet. If you enjoy and value poetry, please like and subscribe to my channel and share it with others who might enjoy it too. Visit my website, theolderamericanpoet.com, to contact me, find out about upcoming readings, and how to purchase books. Remember, young or old, novice or pro, poetry is for everyone. So join me, and let's do poetry together.